Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 384 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and I am so glad that you are here with me today as I'm talking to Renda Stefano, who was truly such a pleasure to chat with. Um, we talk about a little bit about crafting and when to put down the writing. What does that look like in your life? Oh, did that strike a little note of fear into your heart? It does not need to, nor should it, but it is something that you might want to think about. It kind of reminds me of Becca Symes, um, Dear Writer, You Should Quit, which is a great book if you have not read that. We're really talking about how to make room and space to do the thing that you want to do the most. And I've been thinking about that because I got this email and I'm just going to share it with you really quick. I'm just going to say the first name. Uh, this came from Gina and I just, this thrilled me. This was from last month, but I'm only remembering to share it today. It says, I'm over here listening to old episodes of How Do You Write? And I just realized I finished my first draft over a month ago. I wrote the climax and couldn't figure out what to follow with because I need to go back and rewrite and untangle a lot. The best part, I wrote nearly the entire thing in 10 minute sprints, often only having one session a day. Around 36,000 words later, I have the very rough zero draft of the first book in my fantasy middle grade series. Couldn't have done this without your podcast or writer newsletter. Gina, I just wanted to say, holy crap, congratulations on finishing the beast of a first draft. It is such a huge accomplishment that most people do not accomplish. People who listen to this podcast, of course, are anomalous. We do finish our books. We do finish our revisions. That's what we do. But they have shown that it's it's some terrible, dreadful statistic, like 97% of people who start a book never finish a book, writing it. And that's not us. And Gina, that is not you. You finished your draft. And what I love about this email is that you did it in 10 minute bursts. Sometimes that is literally all we have. I've written at least two books in 15 minute bursts because that's all I could do at the time. It's all I had the space for in my life, health-wise and mental health-wise. And books get done. Books get done if we show up. Here's the point of what I want to just bring up today is the work that we do always takes less time than we think it will. And at the same time, sometimes it takes so much longer than we hope it will. I can write a book in seven weeks. I know that. Revising it and revising it again and revising it again, that takes time. But the amount of time I believe something will take is always so much less when I actually sit down just to do it. And I am thinking about that in a big way this week because I'm um, on deadline, I'm getting this revision done on the New Zealand memoir. And as you know, uh, <laughs> I had put it off because we were traveling and I thought I would re revise when we were traveling and I didn't. And then I got sick and I couldn't, I could not revise while I was sick. I didn't have brain power to do it. And now I'm doing it and it's just taking so much less time than I thought. It just is when I sit down, I think, oh my God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to work for five or six hours today to hit my goal of revising these 4,000 words. No, it takes an hour and a half. It takes two hours. And yes, I have the luxury and the privilege of having that time in my schedule because this is my job. But even I, I still do that. After so many books, I still think, oh, I can't, I can't possibly do the work that I think I have to today. And then when I show up and sit down, the hardest part is always getting into the chair and opening the manuscript and having those first few thoughts, which go something along the lines of what the hell am I doing here? What was I doing yesterday? What did I plan to do today? And then you grab something and you grab that thread and you pull on it and you keep moving forward and you change a sentence and then you change an idea and you think, oh, this chapter doesn't fit here. Where could it fit? Do I need this chapter? And suddenly two hours have passed and you've done a ton of work or 10 minutes have passed and you've written 300 words 
300 words that you did not have 10 minutes before. Isn't that incredible that we can do that? And that that is how books are written by people showing up and doing little bits of work, 10 minutes here, an hour there, two hours there. Very few of us can write for more than three hours, um, as has been proven. Uh, if you haven't read Cal Newport's book, Deep Work, you should. The brain is good for deep work. Masters of doing their craft can't usually sustain that deep work for more than three to four hours a day. And that's at its max. I've always been more comfortable in the two hour range, two hour range of the two hour sit down of doing my hard, deep, focused, concentrated work is ideal for me in a day. And the rest of the day, I do other things. I do other work things. I teach and I, sometimes I answer email and I do this podcast and I do a bunch of other things. Um, but I only need those 90 minutes, those 120 minutes. Sometimes those just 10 minutes is all I can get. So I want to encourage you, if that's all you have, that's all you need. 10 minutes, get it done, please. But why don't you try that today? 10 minutes, a little bit today is so much better than telling yourself you'll do 30 minutes tomorrow and then not doing it. And you know that, you know that you're squirming. You don't like me saying this because you know it's true and that's okay. I send a big squishy hug along with this and um, my absolute belief in you that you can do this, that you need to do this. No one can tell your story but you. And I want you to do that. I really, really do. Um, my only update around here is that I've been revising, uh, revising and then revising some more. Also, um, I guess I have another update that I made a friend. It was so nice. Um, somebody introduced me to somebody who's in Wellington and we just really hit it off. And I, it's really nice to make a brand new friend. Oh, it's hard to do, you know, it's just hard to do. And I really like her and I'm so happy. So that happened on a day when I got a lot of work done and um, I'm feeling so much better and so much more recovered from COVID. I have found that the last symptom to go is a weakness in my legs. It Last week, it was just really hard to walk any distance at all. My legs just felt like they, they wouldn't hold me up. And at one point, um, I was at a meeting, a, a physical in-person meeting and I squatted down to put something away on a shelf and my squatted legs did not hold me and I toppled backwards and um, it's possible that I broke um, a little wooden thing behind me with my butt so I will be happy when I regain that strength and I, I honestly feel like you know five days later I'm even much better than I was then but I'm trying not to push it I'm st- still resting more than I want to be. And, and I'm still getting a bunch of work done and that feels really, really good. So that's my update. That's all I got for you. Let's get into the bio for Ren. Ren Stefano lives in Connecticut where she was born and raised. When she's not writing thrillers, she's listening to true crime podcasts and crocheting way too many blankets. Learn more at laurendestefano.com. How I'll Kill You is her most recent novel. And here's our interview. Please get some of your own writing done and please enjoy this interview. Happy writing, y'all. Well, I am so glad to have you on the show today. Will you please share your name and your pronouns with us? My name is Renda Stefano and I go by she, her. And I'm so, so excited to be here. Hello, Ren. I'm always so happy to talk to another thriller writer. And um, you're, you're <laughs> when I was looking at, your website, I was like, oh yeah, and another multi-genre passionate person who writes a little bit of everything. So that is always something that's really exciting for me to talk to another person like me. Can you please talk about your process? Because you write a lot of books, you get a lot done. When, where, how? What does it I look do like? write a lot of books. And what's funny that you say that about the multi-genre is that whatever genre I'm currently discussing, people are very shocked to know that I write at the complete other end of the genre kind of rainbow. So whenever I- Genre rainbow, I love that. <laughs> so I'm writing a thriller that's about murder and sort of mayhem and conspiracy. And then I say, well, I do also write picture books for the unicorns and um, and kind of vice versa to say, oh, yes, I would like to write colorful, fun books for children. But I also like to write about a woman who wants to kill her boyfriend. And so, <laughs> so the process is just very different for everything. Um, 
But I would say, so when I'm not working on a book, it's like, I'm not a writer at all. I just, I try to free my mind of any writing thoughts because I found that the more I look for an idea, the more it just kind of hides in the bushes, Mm -hmm. right? You've seen the the meme of Homer Simpson just backing away. (laughs) Yeah, you do. Yeah. And, And so if I just let my mind be my mind and live my life and just have my time doing whatever else I have to do, that's when a story finds me eventually mm-hmm. could take a month could take a year it's it's hard to wait but that's how it goes and then once I have that idea that's when it becomes really intense that's mm-hmm. when I start writing every single day and that becomes a process of okay if I can do this first thing in the morning wake up have some breakfast and then I'll just know no matter what else I do today whatever finds me if I end up having just a lot of other family things to do or I'm just not feeling very well then I'll know that I did something mm-hmm. and I can I can hang my hat on that and so even if it's 20 words or a thousand words or 2000 words I'll just know that I did something at the start of my day and that'll carry me through a first draft mm, are you more of a pantser or a plotter Oh, total pantser. I don't even know what a plot is. I don't know how to do it. It becomes very much, um, and I I mentioned this process to my partner who said, well, maybe there's something wrong with you, but it's working because I don't know what I'm doing at all. But then as I'm going along, it somehow connects. Um, I, I don't plan a thing, but it all starts to build or I realize, oh, that thing three pages ago just isn't working. I'm gonna throw that away, but here's what I'm gonna put in its place. And anytime I've tried to plan or organize, um, it's just fallen apart. My, the book I hated most writing was one that I completely plotted out. I hated the entire experience and I would never, ever do it again. Yeah, even doing, I, um, I have an IP coming out and it's my very first IP that I'm really excited about. And for that, um, I thought- Can you tell the, me what IP is? Um, all I'm thinking is so intellectual yes. property. It is an intellectual property. So oh, it's okay. when a company essentially says, okay, we have an idea for an existing IP or a brand new IP. In this case, it's Peter Pan. Oh. And so I thought, oh, they're going to give me the whole outline. So this will be interesting. But I had this great editor who she said, you know what? You just do what you want. I trust you. I've read your books. <laughs> back to the, just back to the pantsing my way through. <laughs> so when you speak, you, you sound like you have this glorious level of trust in yourself and your process. Has that, I'm, I'm ready to be jealous of you. Has that always been just like who you are or have you walked your way there? I, so I, I, what I, what I would love for every aspiring writer or maybe even career writer listening to know is that I fail more than I succeed. Yes. And I think that's probably true for most people. And before I wrote, so in 2009, I sold my very first book. If we want to go way back to- Oh, we're like sisters. That's how different the industry was just to think of how- Oh yeah. Remember we were getting our copy edits on paper. Oh yeah. I used to get a big, huge 20 pound chunk of mail (laughs) and I had to sit there with it. It was, yeah, it was hard. Contracts, everything is digital now, but back then was not. And oh my gosh. So for that, it was- I had not so long ago, I mean, a couple of years prior to that, graduated college. And I spent all of college thinking, oh, college is my time to write my great novel. And I I spent that whole time writing, trying, starting books. None of them worked. And then after college, okay, college didn't teach me how to be an adult. What do we do now? <laughs> and Seriously. Writing so many books while finding various jobs that I could bear to do with that time and none of them selling. And eventually what happened was I got the interest of an agent who said, um, how did she put it? She said, I I think you have a lot of talent. I don't think this is the story that's going to get you there, but let me know what else you have. And so I thought, oh, great. Like I have, I have interest. That's more than I've had. And then a couple of months later, when I was feeling kind of down in the doms and not sure if my next idea was any good, she actually emailed me unsolicited to see how my writing was going. Okay. That's for real. (laughs) Now I have 
write this. I have to write something. I have to. And so I did. And I, again, I think she was like, we're not quite there yet, but let's, and this is the only person out of all the people that I'm querying that has any interest back mm-hmm. in the day when we queried by snail mail, mm-hmm. <laughs> which term I don't know if anybody knows anymore, but I, I got the interest of an agent. And so I just kept writing until I had something she liked. Then we went out together and nobody wanted it. And then we did that a couple more times. <laughs> I lost count of how many times, but eventually, you know, it was when I turned my brain off. When I said, you know what? I don't know. She sent me an email, the same agent who I still work with, you know, Barbara, best, best ever. Barbara, and, Barbara Coelho. Oh, well, oh Barbara my Coelho. God. She's my favorite. She's, uh, we, we've spent way too much time in bars in the past. Oh, she, she's uh, yeah. my favorite too. <laughs> she's, she's a shark. She's great. She's amazing. And she's just really, really motivational. Really. You can tell she just mm-hmm. every, with her whole being loves what she does. Yep. And we, so she sent me, it was at the time, a short story of some kind, some submission, and she wasn't going to make any money if I sold it. But she said, you know, I know you're hurting for some cash. Why don't you give this a try? And so I was like, okay, I'll just write a short story. And it became my, my novel that sold. Oh and my I, gosh. What a sideways way to get there. And I didn't expect it at all. I was, you know, 9 PM in my pajamas eating dinner and I get a phone call that my book is being going to auction. And it was just complete, completely. And I never expected even to have a substantial career writing. I just really yeah. like writing. Yeah. And so I thought, oh, you know, I'll write a book and it'll be like a fun story. I can tell at parties. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think it's that um, I, what I learned right away at the very start, e- even before the start is you just write the thing and then whatever happens is going to be where it's meant to go. So all the things that nobody will ever see and probably thank God that they won't, they're not <laughs> looking back, but you know, I'm glad I wrote them and I'm glad they happened and I'm glad I had the experience and that yeah. just continues to be the case. Cause it happens. It still happens. You still write things that nobody wants. Yeah. And that's something that, um, that, that new writers don't quite understand. You, we think when we get the agent that they will be able to sell the book and mm-hmm. Sometimes they just can't. My last book that just sold um, almost didn't sell. It was so close. And then it suddenly went to a, a minor auction. And, oh but it was, it, I was ready to self-publish it. That was, I was, I had sent yeah. my agent the email that said like, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to take this back from you and I'm happy to self-publish it, you know? So I had one like that yeah. too. I had one where I was just so attached to it. I just could not let it go. Yeah. And it was actually my agent saying, you know what? I think I, I agree with you. I don't know why nobody wanted this. Who knows? With it someday. You broke right in there. Um, sorry, maybe it's my internet connection now. Can you say again what your uh, agent said? Oh, so my agent said, you know, I just think it'll benefit you to to let this one go. And it was, Ugh. and it was tough. And this was not that long ago. This is into my career. Yeah. This is, you know, maybe three or three or four years. I don't know. It's a blur now, but not that long ago. And it was, I really thought I knew what I was doing. I had read so many things in the genre and I still, I still am baffled, but I think that that happens. It happens to everybody. I know a lot of writers who have a lot of talent and have a really prolific career beyond anything I've ever done, who I think they have a great idea and somehow just nobody wants it. Mm-hmm. And yet we continue. We the we things that have going. the benefit yeah. of reading that nobody will ever know that other authors yeah. have written. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> great. What, what is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? Okay, my biggest challenge. Uh, so I feel like my biggest challenge is finding the right idea and identifying the right idea because you don't know. So we all are living in our, our own worlds uh, and we're all reading kind of our own favorite things and yeah. we're all seeing the news in the world from our own perspective. And so you think you write something topical, you think you write something useful, or you think you have an idea or you, you go in really wanting to do some good somewhere yeah. or, or even just to entertain in some way. And you, you hit the ground running. And then it's almost like you're running up a slide and you're just destined to keep slipping back down. And how many times will you do it before you realize you're on a slide, not a staircase? <laughs> it's a greased slide sometimes. <laughs> a greased slide and somebody's throwing watermelons down at you. And 
<laughs> so <laughs> you're not, you're not getting there. Yeah. How do you keep going when you feel like you're running up that grease slide? Well, I think that's when it's a good time to take a break. Mm. And something I really had to learn that was really hard is that your career and your, whatever you're doing, whatever your career is and your writing, just, it can't be your whole identity. Yeah. You have to make time for hobbies, self-care, for family, you know, take a walk, um, do something else. And I, I think the more you push it at times, the the harder it gets to, to A, let go of the idea that you don't want to let go of, and then B, to make room for a better one to come along. Mm, I'm so resentful that everything you said is true. <laughs> you know, I just yeah. hate, I hate walking away from things. And sometimes we have to do that. We have to get that break. We have to get that space. Yeah. That is beautiful. Um, what is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? Finding the right idea. <laughs> <laughs> Finding that idea. When you have that idea and, and by the time I do get to the idea, that's, that's viable. And that's how I'm going to define the right idea. Um, when I, when I do get to that idea, that's the right idea. I don't even trust it anymore because it usually comes either at the end of a long dry spell or at the end of so many things I thought I was sure about. It's really, it's really trippy. It's like a kaleidoscope in your head trying to find a good color and, you know, you know, like the the kaleidoscope shades going and orange and green and red and trying to identify what am I looking at? What do I want? What's the good one here? So when I finally get there, I'm more trepidatious and it's almost like, you're in the dark and there's a tiny little flame and you just don't want it to go out. So you don't want to breathe near it too hard. <laughs> yes. Yes. But you also have this like unbearable hope that this is it. This, is, this is the one for now. Yeah. The one for and now. that's when I yeah. think I, I reach a certain point where I start to recruit somebody else. Mm-hmm. I'll just say, can you just take a look at this? Can you just tell me if this is horrible? Cause I, I have people that I know will tell me if it's not working and that's yeah. that, but I wait, I wait because I need it to be formed enough that somebody can make an opinion on it. Mm, And having those people that we can rely on is huge and so, so, so important in this industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you share a craft tip with us? So, yeah. So my favorite thing to do when I'm writing is focus on my characters. I love the character development. And I've, I've heard a lot of people say that that's something they really enjoy in, in my writing. And I get a lot of questions from readers. How do I make characters be more you know, fully fleshed out? And what I like to do is I like to think of like backstories for them. So things about their childhood, their relationships, things that maybe won't make it onto the page, but it's a fun brain exercise. And it's also, there's really nothing to gain or lose, right? Because you're not writing it down. It's just kind of all in your head. And doing this really helps me to understand how the characters I'm writing will in, will engage with the story that I'm writing. So if I know that this character had this type of background, then this is probably the kind of thing they'll say in, in this given situation. How much time do you spend doing that? Is that kind of something that you do like when you're on a walk or... Or is it something that you sit sit at your desk and like think through? How does that work? It's a really good activity just when you're out and about. So driving, chores, whatever you're doing. Yeah. And shower and you make no notes of it. It's just kind of all only if it's really good. If I if I see something that's really if it either if it comes to me several times and I start to think, oh, I think this is this is relevant to something that's happening, or I think it might end up on the page somewhere, that's when I start to to write it down. Do the thing, do their backstory surprise you? No, that's, I think that's what makes it Ah. so organic is that, you know, if I, if I told you a story about somebody you knew and you say, oh, classics era, of course. Right. Yeah. You're getting the classic moments of these characters and this is how they were formed into being classics era, classic, whoever. Yeah. Yeah. Which was so big for this story in particular too, because it was three sisters And they grew up in kind of different settings, different environments, and they grew up to be serial killers. What are the odds that three people from the same family would be serial killers, right? So I needed to really think about what could have happened that would, that would lead to that. Oh, just those words too. That's like, that's, that's high concept right there. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. I was, wasn't trusting it. <laughs> what is the kindest thing that anyone's ever done for you in your writing career? So I spoke a few years ago with an author who's, I won't name, um, but just a very talented author who I really look up to to this day. And she was reading something I'd written and she said, 
would you like some hard critique or are you just looking for encouragement today? What and a good question. I yeah. And I, you know, it made me sit with that too, because mm -hmm. there is this feeling that, oh, to be good, I have to always be taking critique. Right. But that's, if you get that on a bad day, it could be the thing that makes you put down your story forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So what did you say? I don't remember now. <laughs> I think probably the hard critique, you know, if you, if you have access to somebody with that kind of generosity, you, you want to yeah. know what they really think. Yeah. But, but there are days, sorry. Oh, go on. No, there are days when you really just need to get the words on the page. Um, you just need to get to the next one and you just tell me something nice. You don't have to lie, but just find something nice and redeeming. Like it's a good, it's good that you wrote 200 words. You're going to have to delete them, but good job. <laughs> <laughs> and I do believe that praising what we do well makes us do more of it, makes us think harder about the, the reason we're doing it. But what I love what that, that author did for you is there's a, um, there's this theory and I can't remember who came up with it, but the, the idea of a permissioned request. Like, mm -hmm. um, when I, when I used to teach like in front of a classroom, when no one was ever allowed to give critique in my classes, unless they said, I have an opinion about the way you structured this scene. Would you like to hear it? And then the, the writer got to say yes or no. And the no would be respected. Although most writers always said yes. Um, and it's the same thing. I would always demonstrate to the, them to this, this um, concept at the beginning of class, I would ball up a piece of paper and I would throw it at somebody mm -hmm. and they wouldn't, and they wouldn't catch it. It would hit them in the face. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, I would ball up another piece of paper and I would say, you know, Joseph catch. And I would throw it at them I'd throw it at him. And he would catch it. And it's the same thing. Like if we have that preparation, if she had come out with you with hard critique, you would, it's possible you would have shut down, but because she asked mm -hmm. you, you had the control to say, uh, yes, I would like the hard critique or no, and I wouldn't. You're braced for it too. Now you you're braced. You yeah. Yeah. I love that she did that. That's, that's yeah, a really, I use that now. I, I think that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the kindest thing you've ever done for yourself as a writer? So I stopped writing at night. Um, I, I started because early on in my career, again, I was in my early twenties, I had a lot of energy and I was just ready to take on the world. And I didn't really have like a family, you know, to like worry about. And so at that time in my life, um, I was waking up in the middle of the night, had my laptop on my bed or by my bed. And, you know, I, I was just really constantly on that high of wanting to write a story and all that creative energy that was turning around. And as I have been in my career for a while, I've realized, you know, I love what I do, but it's not going to love me back. So mm. there needs to be a time where I put this down. So this is time for family. This is time to be present in whatever this moment is. And especially once I'm in bed, we're done. There's no more screen. It's over. It's yeah. time to read or to kind of consume something that is calming and helpful to me. And, and it really does, although it's, I'm no longer going at it, you know, with that kind of intensity, it's been a lot better and more productive to just say, this is the time to work. Mm -hmm. And then this is the time to, and it, the time to work is really any time in the day. Um, but we're done. We're done at nighttime. <laughs> I absolutely love that. And again, you sound so beautifully balanced. It is really, really nice oh, to good. hear. I'm glad I found that way. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> what is the best book that you've read recently and why did you love it? So interestingly, it was a nonfiction. Mm -hmm. You might've heard of it's, um, the Jeanette McCurdy memoir. I'm glad oh, my mom read I loved you it. Know, what did you love I, about it? I, so I read the audio book because I really mm -hmm. wanted to hear her read. And so with, with Jeanette McCurdy, I'm a little bit older than her. So I didn't catch her time on TV, but I did grow up consuming that sort of children's media. So as a child growing up watching Nickelodeon and Disney channel and being a young person, I saw the standard of, you know, what was glamorous or what was pretty or what was the norm, especially for young girls. And I always saw these, you know, actors my own age on TV with beautiful hair and, you know, always like a witty comeback and like a nice, you know, family and perfect friends, you know, and I was trying forever to live up to that. And then to read this memoir and kind of get a look from the inside and how exploited these actors are and mm -hmm. you know what they're going through and how it's all just like kind of an image on a screen and her perspective on you know 
laws and protections that really need to be in place for these actors. And here I am as like a, <clears throat> a 12 or a 13 year old thinking like, oh, they have it together. Why don't, why don't I have that? I was in the mirror cutting my hair or trying to have that haircut or, you know, mm -hmm. just trying to dress like they dressed and trying to have the family they had you know so it was just really and I think it's something you can only really read as an adult and look back and see like of course that's what was going on I love the way she wrote it too she wrote it in in the in the brain of the age that she was so there's these beautiful mm -hmm. parts where she's like talking about how much her mother loves her by yeah. wanting her to be so strong and us or, 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 you know, to be, you know, to work so hard and us as the adult readers are going, your mom is abusing you. Your mom is abusing you. Yeah, she had sure. such a, she did it so well. And um, yeah. yeah, I, and it was funny and great. And I, I yeah. wish I had read the audiobook. The audiobook, yeah. yeah, it's, I recommend it. But the, I think the, the horrible email her mother sent her, you're no longer my daughter, PS, send us a new fridge, you know, just, I can't fathom it. <laughs> Did you hear her talking to um, Glennon Doyle on the, on, is it the, I can't remember. We could do hard things podcast. Oh, I don't know. I got, I caught That's a, good. Few, her, yeah. a few of her interviews. I don't remember the yeah. specifics, but yeah, here, even hearing her talk, she just yeah. she's really so well-spoken about it all yeah. and, and trauma, you know, just to be able to sit there so calmly and, and talk yeah. about that. And she's such yeah. a good writer. She's such a good, and oh, she's, she's one of those writer. writers um, that like, you know, a lot of celebrity memoirs are not really written by the celebrity. We all know that because we know we have the friends who are writing those celebrity memoirs, but you could tell that she wrote that. That is her passion. Writing is yeah. a passion. Yeah. And you know? that's the, you know, the vignette style and just like, you really, you can tell that that was a book of the heart. That was yeah. not a book she wrote to just share her story or make money. That was definitely, I've had this story in me since 1990, you know, that yeah. was a needed story. There was a book of trauma recovery. Yeah. And funny. Yeah. Speaking of amazing books, can you please tell us a little bit about how I'll kill you? Oh my gosh. Okay. So it is about <laughs> three identical triplets. Hey. Who... <laughs> like literally take my money at that point. Identical triplets, <laughs> take it. Yeah, everybody loves multiples. And I think that, that was that kind of came about from growing up in the 90s when for whatever reason multiples were just all over the talk show circuit. Obsessed. Yes. People, oh, we had infertility, then we had seven children and one, you know, um, there was so much of that quintuplets, quadruplets, yes. you know. And so I thought, um, triplets, right? But then it from their perspective, they were abandoned. They never knew who their biological family were. And at first they're all over the news and every, it's a novelty. They, so they ended up getting a good chunk of money just in donations and savings for them, and, which is how they fund their lifestyle. And, <laughs> but they, you know, they, they ended up after the media kind of died down and they were no longer in the spotlight and no longer like fun and shiny and cute. They were just thrown into the foster system, just like every other kid in the foster system. And they ended up having three respective, very different upbringings and the narrator she goes by jade not her real name but she's the only one of the three who had somewhat of a nuclear foster family and with that came a just tremendous tremendous amount of because growing up in this nice house with this really loving foster mother and like a foster brother she was really you know friendly with to, to look over and see her sisters being miserable, it kind of instilled in her this idea that, okay, I need to be suffering too. We need to have solidarity. And so now here they are as adults. And because of one of them in particular, having just like a really traumatic upbringing, um, she killed somebody and the other two came in to help and, and clean up. And it just kind of became a ritual of theirs where they realized, okay, we're not cut out for family life. We're not cut out for relationships. So we're just going to kind of get our kicks where we can. And then we're going to kill our partner and move on. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I love this wicked look on your face too, when you're talking about it. Fun story to write. So fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I hope that it is flying from the shelves. It is already out, right? It has been yes. out for a little bit. Yeah. I'm always behind them. Yeah. And when I, when I, when I get people um, slotted on the show and I am so excited to read it, can you please tell us where we can find you out there? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram and it's Lauren DeStefano author. So that is where I am. Perfect. And you're a crocheter. I know. So um, yes, we can uh, yeah. connect on that. I'm a huge knitter and also a crocheter, but like 
the knitting is what has always been around me. Oh, the yeah. knitting is like literally killing me right now. I'm so hot. And I forgot to take it off before I started. Recording. It's beautiful. It is, thank you. It is a delight to talk to you. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for having me. This is so fun.